It's been nearly seven years European Union, Latin American and Caribbean foreign ministers haven't held a combined high-level summit in all of that time. Now the EU finally wants to talk to its Latin American cousins. But as its relationships elsewhere nosedive, is getting back to talking enough to repair the damage? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Philip Hampshire. The European Union hosted Latin American and Caribbean leaders at a long-awaited summit to soothe strained ties, but found themselves divided over how to address Russia's war in Ukraine. The EU is starting to look more supportive of its Latin American friends, pledging more investment for them and the Caribbean islands in a bid to counterbalance China's Belt and Road Initiative in the region. Some want more though, Argentina and Brazil calling for free trade deals to be bolstered. But this isn't one-way traffic. The EU are keen to unlock trade deals struck with Mexico in 2018 and ones with a bloc including Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay in 2019. And there's been admissions of wrongs in the past. The EU admitting Europe's slave trading past inflicted untold suffering on millions of people. And they've hinted at the need for reparations for crimes against humanity. So, enough to improve relations in the longer term? So let's meet our guests. In Leiden, in the Netherlands, we have Michael Hugovin, who is the Dutch MEP, a European Conservatives and Reformist, and he's also a member of the International Trade Committee. Meanwhile, in Guadalquivir, in Ecuador, we have Beatriz Garcia Nice, who is an associate Latin America program at the Wilson Center. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Michael, um, let me start with you. Do you think the European Union has been neglecting Latin America over the last few years? Well, we have been negotiating from the EU side um, the trade deal with the Mercosur countries for since 1999. So neglecting would be a big word. But what we have seen in the last 20 years is that the rise of China and the influence of China in the region has risen significantly. Um, they went from 18 billion, the Chinese went from 18 billion dollar of trade in 2002 to 450 billion in 2022. So. Um, while China is gaining influence in the region, we could say that the EU, European countries are losing influence in the region. Beatrice, you're obviously in Latin America at the moment, being in Ecuador. How does the picture look from where you are? Do you feel that Latin America has been neglected by the European Union or vice versa? I think that, you know, in Latin America, there's been certain issues that have taken preeminence over relationships with blocs such as the European Union. Right now, Latin American countries are going themselves through an inward looking trend with you know, many uh, governments running into autocracies, dictatorships even in some parts of the region. And I think that China did fill that void that both the European Union and the United States left. But in a way it was a mutual um, you know, misunderstanding between regions, especially during the government of Brazilian former president Jair Bolsonaro, which really truncated relationships and negotiations between Mercosur and the European Union. Mikhail, that's got to be a fair comment, hasn't it? There have been some rather difficult personality clashes between some of the Latin American leaders, Bolsonaro being the most obvious of them, and the European Union. Well, I think you always have to deal with different styles of, of government personalities. Um, I don't think that should be uh, the big hindrance in, in actually having better relations. I think the, the biggest hurdle on, on, on improving relations, on improving trade relations with uh, Latin American countries have, has been that we as European countries have been trying to impose many of our rules, regulations, um, climate governance and other social issues on uh, the economies that are not necessarily com uh, compatible uh, with our governance, so to say. Uh, and if you look at, for example, China, well, they come in, uh, they trade, they, they don't want to interfere with domestic political affairs. Um, so they, are, they have left much less demands. Um, and I think that has given uh, the People's Republic of China definitely a competitive advantage in the region. 
Michael, is that an indication, if you like, of part of the difficulty that the European Union faces in that it always keeps tacking on to the end of uh, its trade relationships, regulations, human rights, all sorts of areas that other countries go, ah, do you know what? I'm really not that interested in this, especially since the European Union and Mercosur have been talking, as you said, since before the turn of the millennium. Yeah, so I think that's a very fair point that you're making. And I think that the European Union really needs to wake up in a new geopolitical reality, especially since the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we are now seeing a more of a blockization in world politics. And we, we really have to fight for, for our influence, for our uh, trade relations in order to um, keep having this, this influence on the world stage. So we need to be more pragmatic. Um, as I always say, in, the Dutch, in Dutch, we have a very nice saying, you can either be um, a merchant or a reverend. And we should more focus on uh, the merchant style instead of imposing our rules, regulation and governance. Beatrice, uh, we were just hearing from Mikhail there. He, he mentioned Ukraine and Russia. Now, obviously, that's going to be a big part of the topic. It was certainly a big part of the conversation when people met up. Uh, between the European Union and Latin America. Here is a comment from that meeting from the uh, current Brazilian president, Lula da Silva. I think there are a lot of people who were very nervous and very enthusiastic six months ago and who now need to find someone who represents the possibility of finding the path to peace. That's what Brazil has been doing all along. We're talking to China, we're talking to Indonesia, we're talking to our partners in Latin America. We need to build a group of countries capable of convincing Russia and Ukraine at the right time. That's the way forward. Beatrice, uh, those comments from Lula da Silva, those aren't going to have been very well received by the European Union, which is still funding and financing and sending equipment and materiel to Ukraine. The comments obviously by President Lula da Silva were certainly unfortunate on the illegal invasion of Russia into Ukraine. I believe that Latin American countries don't necessarily see Lula as the spokesperson on what they certainly believe or think. You have many different you know, countries that do not support this illegal invasion. Case in point is President Boric from Chile, who has been very vocal on this, and he was during the CELAC EU summit. But there's also certain issues that don't necessarily are on top agendas for Latin American countries. The invasion into Ukraine is certainly detrimental to international law and international order. But the way that Latin American countries see it is as a far away conflict that doesn't necessarily mean that they should take an important or necessary stance. Mikhail, this is a difficulty for the European Union because, um, as Beatrice quite rightly says, if you're South American, Ukraine seems a very, very long way away. And yet the European Union and the United States are sort of trying to build up a, a block of people who support them. Meanwhile, Russia and China on the other side are trying to build up a block of, at best, neutral countries, but at worst, countries that lean in their direction. Is the EU in trouble on this particular front? Well, in an ideal world, I would love to see the world united against the Russian aggression. Uh, unfortunately, that's not very realistic in geopolitics because countries look at what serves their interests. And indeed, for Latin, many Latin American countries, obviously Latin American countries are quite diverse, so it, it, it differs per country. But for many countries, it's indeed a faraway conflict. And what serves their interest is good relations with both the People's Republic of China, the Russian Federation, um, maybe for crude oil or natural gas, uh, but also uh, good relations with the EU. So they really try to balance this out. So I kind of understand where they, where, where they are, where, where they were going to. I believe, as European, obviously, it would serve their interest in order to align with uh, w with the West in order to um, uh, really say that the Russian aggression was indeed illegal because it sets a precedent. But I also understand the well the things that that really makes the uh, the Latin American countries uh, think. If I take this across to you, uh, Beatrice, um, we've got a quote here from the Argentine president as well, where he's commenting on the uh, same area, the issues with regards to the European Union and the pressure it was trying to place on Latin American and Caribbean leaders with regards to Ukraine. 
No, primer punto. I want to make it clear that this is a summit between the European Union and CELAC trying to find political, economical and cultural ties between Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean. It's taking place with the backdrop of a war from when Russia invaded Ukraine. I want to affirm that the vast majority of CELAC countries have condemned the Russian invasion in the United Nations. This is a journalistic speculation over the objective of the summit that it was on the Ukraine issue. The problems that you are putting up do not exist. Of course there was differing voices but this was not the objective of the summit and the issue of Ukraine did not hamper the progress that this summit needed. Beatrice, um, so if you like that's the president of Argentina, uh, Alberto Fernandez, trying to tamp down the Ukraine issue he clearly doesn't want a slice of that. Who does the European Union have the best relationship with in South America with regards to this issue? It's a, it's a tough one there. It is a very tough one, I have to say. I think the best person for this or the best country, if we could say, is President Gabriel Boric of Chile. He has certainly championed right, the need for us and for Latin American countries to respect the international order to be against and be vocal about this illegal invasion of Russia into Ukraine. So I think that President Boric in this particular case is a really good ally to find ways to bring together countries in the hemisphere. Mikhail, when you're talking to countries in Latin America, obviously you're on the trade side of things. Who do you think that uh, the EU has the best relationship with and who is really, uh, do you know what, we don't really want to deal with the EU, we'd rather deal with other trade blocs around the world where it's less difficult or less contentious. Well, that's difficult to say. Um, uh, to come back to your point on the eu CELAC summit, I think indeed uh, it was very counterproductive to put so much emphasis on uh, the Ukraine, on, on the war in Ukraine. Uh, but on the other hand, also the subject of colonialism came up. And I, I, I really wanted to see um, the focus being more on trade, on improving trade relations, getting rid of tariffs, uh, creating jobs, uh, having a middle class to grow in Latin American countries. Um, but yeah, if you look at different countries, well, I, I think the main driver would be that economic freedom is, is the solution for Latin American countries. So if you look at the very different countries, Cuba, for example, is very much less inclined to have better relationships with the EU uh, when compared to, for example, the Dominican Republic, um, Colombia compared to Venezuela. I mean, it's, it's the same story. Uh, if, if it's countries with economic freedom, they're more inclined to have, be to have better relations with the European Union. Is that part of the reason why negotiations with Mercosur are taking so long, Mikhail? Because there are so many voices and they are so different in their, their, their direction that they take. Well, for the Mercosur trade agreement, the main focus would be on Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. Uh, I think that is mu very much more aligned. I think the main uh, topic of discussion um, that's hindering the Mercosur trade deal now is the uh, binding climate and uh, environmental protection chapters that the European Union all of a sudden focuses on. The chapter was already in the trade deal, but it wasn't legally binding. And now there is much more emphasis on these chapters to become legally binding. And that is really um, a big um, uh, hurdle for, for Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. Beatrice, do you agree with that? Do you think the EU's uh, sort of best chances for good relations with Latin America are down in the southern cone? I think that what Latin Americans are ultimately wanting to do is to be considered equal partners, right? Not just seen as commodity rich countries that have something to give. And once more wealthier, more developed nations take that, you know, they're forgotten. I think that both Brazil and Argentina, especially within the Mercosur bloc, more so than Uruguay and Paraguay, are trying to really situate and place themselves as equal partners that can certainly negotiate some of these clauses that the European Union countries are putting in front of them. It will take a lot of negotiation because President Lula da Silva and also President Alberto Fernandez from Argentina are not necessarily, um, you know, they have the public support to push back for these agreements to be completely beneficial for their countries and their industries. 
you know, before they are or the results wanted by European Union countries. Well, certainly, as you were saying there, Beatrice, talking to some of the people, as, I, as I've talked to some of the people who attended the conference, off the record, extraction economy was certainly uh, a phrase that came up quite often. And usually within a couple of sentences of that, some reference to colonialism and some reparation, uh, reference to reparations for slavery, generally those three phrases all got tacked together. How salient an issue, how big an issue are reparations and colonialism for South Americans still? I think it's more prevalent of an issue for Caribbean countries. And we see that with the presidency of CELAC being held by the presidents St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in which colonialism and slave trade certainly had a detrimental effect up until now into their economies. For other Latin American countries, especially those that were conquered by the Spanish 400 years ago, it's certainly relevant, right? And like I said, Latin American governments right now are trying to just play on a level basis. They're trying to be seen as equal partners and not repeat history itself where extractivism and for lack of a better word, just taking resources and not distributing them in what's best for the populations, their own populations in their countries um, can, can have a detrimental you know, impact within their um, countries. Mikhail, uh, for th on the subject of reparations and colonialism, obviously this topic isn't going away and it seems to be getting, if, if you like, a little bit stronger in terms of the amount that people are talking about it. Is this an issue for your sort of level at the European Union level or is this more for a sort of a national government's level? I think it's absolutely counterproductive to focus on this subject. It is something that has happened in the past, uh, a very long time ago. How long ago was colonialism in, in Latin America? The last country to have gained independence, I think, was St. Kitts and Nevis, that, which was back in 1983. But most of the countries in Latin America gained independence in the 19th century, and some even when uh, my country, the Netherlands, was part of the French Napoleonic Empire. So. Um, I don't believe la some, some Latin American countries are poor because of colonialism. They are poor because of poor policies. Um, so we, no we don't need to promise them apologies or reparations. We need to focus on free and fair trade and economic prosperity. And again, if you look at where the countries that have actual economic freedom, uh, Dominican Republic compared to Cuba, um, uh, Venezuela compared to uh, Colombia, it's the same story everywhere. Some countries are rich, some countries are poor, but that, that mostly has to do with the policies. How do you think the European Union can help them in these circumstances then? Is it simply through negotiating better trade deals or do you think the European Union needs to take a slightly less uh, sort of paternalistic view and sort of get in there on a, on a more comradeship level with the Latin American countries to help them out of some of their difficulties? Well, I think we need a more balanced approach. So on the one hand, I think we, we need to have a more of a, a Chinese style approach where we are much more pragmatic, we much more focus on trade. On the other hand, we should be the reliable partner. China has proven to be not a, a very reliable partner when it comes to extraction, when it comes to uh, products um, um, uh, going, uh, or sorry, manufacturing um, uh, done by, by the Chinese in these countries. So we can be a much more reliable partner, have much more reliable governance and have much have much more reliable trade. Beatrice, um, if we were to sort of have uh, several European Union economic specialists here, I'm sure very quickly in this conversation we'd hit a point where one of them would say, well, hang on a second. It's got nothing to do with the European Union, whether or not South Africa, uh, sorry, South America operates as an extraction based set of economies. If they want more manufacturing, that's an internal policy issue. It's got nothing to do with us. But whenever the conversation is listened to from the Latin American side, there seems to be a certain amount of resentment that Europe keeps going to South America for resources and not for finished goods. Is that fair of me to say or not? It is fair for you to say, right? Uh, there is certain resentment, even 400, you know, even if 400 years have passed, 
since colonialism happened in Latin America, but has up to this day, it still has a deep effect, the extractivism that we see and the disregard to human life, human rights, and the development problems that the region has. Having said that, though, we do have to be cognizant and as Latin American countries, we do have to recognize that internally we have several problems that do not let our economies develop the way that they should. For example, corruption is rampant and you know, electoral leaders are necessarily not the best ones at times. Um, our population is not necessarily well educated at many points. So I do think that Latin American countries need to have some sort of self-screening. Um, but I think that also the way that colonialism has influenced, it is an icky subject that the European Union, when trying to come into these trade deals, needs to be cognizant about when and how they do business with Latin America, now that they're certainly trying to establish new uh, supply lines and now that critical minerals are so permissible with um, new technologies. So Beatrice, when, when people like Michel are talking to Latin American countries and they're talking to them, they're saying, look, let's do trade deals. Let's talk about trade and economics and where we go from here. What, the, what are the Latin American countries saying back to Europe? What is it that they want out of this relationship? I think they want a couple things. The first one is, like I said, to be considered as equal partners. The second is to not be seen as just commodity extraction countries, but that they can have a say in the, in, in the finished product. For example, let's say for batteries, right? The lithium triangle between Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia has one of the most vast resources for lithium that are needed right now for the transition to a more clean energy. Latin American countries that just don't want to give that resource, those resources without getting something in return. So yes, they want trade deals, but they only want trade deals that are beneficial and see the results of the end product that those commodity prices are gonna give. Michael, uh, we're running out of time here, so last question for you, if I may. Um, from the European Union side, what do you think the European Union needs to offer to Latin America to sort of get a deal done? We've been waiting now nearly, not quite, but nearly 25 years. Is it going to be another decade before we get something through? I think the deal was almost done. Uh, until the moment where the European Union uh, started demanding for binding uh, climate demands, binding uh, demands on uh, deer for deforestation, for example. And uh, that was really a big setback for in order to get the agreement done. But I, I think um, on terms, in terms of tariffs, uh, getting rid of tariffs on, on, on cars, on chocolate, on textiles, on, um, uh, for Latin American countries to invest in the EU, I think everything was there. Um, so I just, I just think that we need to sort out these uh, hindrances or irritants on, on, on the binding climate uh, demands, on the binding deforestation demands. I think deforestation is a very important uh, topic. But again, we shouldn't impose our own uh, set of standards of global governance on the Latin American countries. We should really have an equal playing field on that regard. Last little from you, Beatrice. Uh what does Latin America think when Europe goes down there and says, let's talk about the environment? It depends what country they're talking to, right? I think that Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva from Brazil, especially um, having such a big stake in Amazon uh, conservation, welcomes, um, welcomes the questions, but has certainly been very protective of the way that Brazil will handle its internal affairs. It is certainly certainly a um, improvement from the previous administration, but there's certainly room, you know, he can be better. You also can talk to President Petro, Gustavo Petro from Colombia, and he is trying to put the environment on the top of his agenda. So I think you'd have a very receptive government to talk to. You also have uh, Chilean President Boric, that has just situated a national strategy for the extraction of lithium, taking into consideration the pledges that he's made on the environment and trying to have a balance on this. 
you have Argentina, for example, with uh, Baca Muerta, the oil extraction area that they have, in which they need to um, continue to develop its economy, but they're very understanding and cognizant of the risks that that entails into their um, environmental pledges. So it just depends on the country that you talk to in Latin America. I think that Latin American countries now are very open to listening and to making agreements that, like I said, are beneficial for both parties and that are certainly taking care of the environment. Beatrice, Michael, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me today. I'm afraid that's all we have Pleasure. time for for this show. But remember, you can see more discussion and debate if you head on over to our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and the entire team, thank you for watching and goodbye.